today I, I wanted to, uh, to come to you to talk about dreams, about following your dreams. Great maker means the need to conquer your fears and get over yourself. Tell your story because you are that story. Great maker is about having courage to step forward, to face the unknown, and that's where you find your character. I believe that all of us are here to tell a story and to do something that makes you happy. The film is about a mother who counsels her son through video diaries. It's a wonderful piece that takes place in 1961. She finds out through the course of an interview that even though her art was rejected, there are people who appreciate what she does. And there's a little twist at the end that I won't give away, you have to see it. So that's what I really hope people can do, is that we start listening to each other, and then we'll ask questions, and then listen and believe. We have our own blocks, our own mindsets, our own obstacles that stop us from getting to the dreams that we want. What do you ladies think that helps empower other people? Be open to giving you know, these women or girls a chance. It was easy. Everybody could do it. Just follow your dreams. All of a sudden, that, that voice doesn't have as much power about, you know, I'm going to go write that screenplay or I'm going to go make that movie. As an example of, like, if you just put your mind to it and get out of your own way, you can make anything you want come true. And I was just blown away. Blown away by the film, blown away by his energy. And when he first started talking about a film fest, I said, I would love to have that here in Red City. So when he told me about Brave Maker, I said, you know what? This is the type of film festival that I want to be aligned with. The treasure that you seek is in the cave that you're afraid to walk into. to run in there as fast as you know I am a brave maker. I am a brave maker. I am a brave maker. I am a brave Well, well, welcome, welcome to the on live Brave Maker experience. I miss those times when we could throw popcorn at each other and sit in a movie theater and talk. My name is Tony Gapastone, and I'm so glad you're all here today. Welcome. Hey, Tony. Christina. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So happy to be back. So excited for the show. Yeah. So this is our, our live event. We do these pretty much every week where we talk to filmmakers and we highlight a film, uh, live action, short, animated, document documentary, all different, great, all different great stories that are being told in all different ways. And before we bring in our special guest today, I want to say thank you to our sponsors. We cannot do this work without our sponsors. We are a 501c3 nonprofit and we have been given special sponsorship by some local we're headquartered in the bay area san francisco bay area in redwood city california so we want to say a huge thank you to the redwood city parks and arts foundation that is super generous to support our work also the san mateo county arts commission also gave us a special grant uh, especially helping us during this covid time that has been completely challenging to uh, our work without having these public screenings and ability to gather in big groups. Uh, we've had a pivot and that's okay. We've done a lot of great things. We're so happy. We've actually probably had more guests than we would have ever had because we're not flying people in and people from all over the country have been able to come and share their work. So we're super excited. And Christina and I also have done uh, a little pivot where we're doing these corporate online discussions and webinars using the arts and film and pop culture. So it's been so, so great. So Christina, why don't you uh, introduce the film that we're going to see today, and then we'll bring in, we'll start with the director and producer to start. Absolutely. So we are talking about The Prison Within. Uh, this is a documentary feature film that really tackles a tough issue that we're having today, which is what is going on with our prison system? How did we go, uh, you know, how did we go from slavery to criminalization? Like, how did we get there? And now how do we heal? How do we dismantle what we've created with our prison system, which 
has had a direct negative impact on myself and my family as it has millions of Americans. So this film really hit close to home for me and I can't wait to dive in and talk to the director and talk to the creative team behind this magnificent piece of work. And we get to talk to some of the very subjects from this film. We're so excited. It just came out on video on demand on Tuesday, the 25th of August, but let's welcome director and producer, Catherine and Aaron. Welcome to the online Brave Maker show. Hello, thank you. Well, why don't we have you introduce yourself, Catherine? We'll start off with you and then Aaron and just talk about how this film started. How did you get connected to this story to talk about these lives and to talk about the impact that trauma and really systemic racism has on people and communities? Sure. So um, Catherine Hervey, I'm the director and producer of The Prison Within. And um, so this film is definitely informed by a lot of work that I was doing in, the, in lots of criminal justice contexts. I was a public defender in Los Angeles. And then after that, I was a volunteer college instructor in a men's prison. Um, so going in every week and really forming relationships there um, and then also working in a lot of restorative justice contexts, both inside and outside and with survivors, as well as just my own personal relationships with people who've been impacted by our systems of incarceration. So all of this really in, informed it. And I wanted to make a film that broke down the divisions of us and them, of people who are in prison versus people who are not in prison. And, you know, the, the connective tissue really connecting all of us is trauma. Mm -hmm. So the, fil the film itself really takes you, it's very intimate and personal into the hearts and minds of the men and women in this film. And my goal with it is that as you go into their hearts and minds, you really start seeing that, but for a set of circumstances, this could have been me. And of, of course that, that de de delves back into trauma. Tony, you're on mute. I was muting myself, thank you. Aaron, let's just hear from, and Catherine, both of you, just so you know, the the film is so moving and eye-opening and it's hard, it's hard to watch. And the idea of trauma and the phrase that is said multiple times in the film, hurt people, hurt people. I was just so impacted by uh, Dion and mm -hmm. her story of when she gives her TED talk. This is a woman whose husband was murdered and the perpetrator of that murder, then she seeks to get you know, on the death penalty. And then she actually turns and she goes on her own healing journey. And she talks about how sad it was for her to recognize her healing was dependent on someone else's misery and destruction. Uh, Catherine, can you just, or sorry, Aaron, can you comment on that as producer, just how you got involved in the navigation of your own personal story and connection to that? Sure, I. Um, that's a wonderful segue because I'm a crime survivor myself. Um, and I knew from my own experience, there's this false personification um, that the system provides closure and solace for crime victims. And like many crime victims, and unfortunately the vast majority of uh, sexual assault survivors like myself, the crime is underreported because people know the criminal justice system will just perpetuate their own trauma, um, whether they're putting the victim on trial, um, families, communities, they aren't healing. And it was really fast fascinating to me to be involved in a project looking at restorative justice and looking at that, my own personal experience and seeing how that likely, just like Sujatha Baliga talked about in the film, probably would have healed um, my trauma as well. And when I met Catherine and I heard about the project, I just, I felt so empowered to rise from a position of complacency that I had had maybe. And I try to make a difference in my daily life, but being able to educate and inform of um, the different movements that are out there through um, a medium like film, it's so powerful and impactful. There's a safety in a theater um, to be able to really experience, as you discussed, um, really experience the pain um, 
in your own way and so that you can process your own maybe undealt trauma as well. And um, most people in prisons are first a victim, victim of the system, victim of intergenerational um, strife, um, racial divides, access to education, access to um, resources within our community that um, is really coming to light in, in the news nowadays. I love that idea of restorative justice. You know, to really help both people on either end, you know, the, 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 per the perpetrator and then the victim, but we're centering around healing and restoration instead of just justice. Because what does that mean? You know, will there be satisfaction in the end of that and healing on the end of that for everyone involved? So I love mm -hmm. that concept. And just to go back to what Catherine was saying about the trauma being the connective tissue, that to me is what really stood out in the documentary. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, my family's been impacted negatively by the prison system. We've had family members who've gone through and we really didn't have a chance to heal. And that wasn't even the conversation. And because we didn't understand their crimes or why they did it, we kind of turned our back on them because we didn't know how to deal with it. Although what we were all really craving in this situation is, you know, some form of healing. I wanted to say the, the film starts with this Peter Levine quote about trauma as a fact of life. Mm -hmm. It does not, however, have to be a life sentence. That's a very powerful way to start. And it brings you into the stories because sometimes, you know, I'm guilty as charged in this where we don't humanize people who are uh, in, in the prison system, right? They're just stories that are, um, you know, a small percent, you know, the tip of the iceberg, we don't see their background. And I felt like you all did a really great job of helping humanize the people. They're, they're not other, they're people. They're just like you, you and me and, and Catherine, how you said it could be any of us. This could be any of us based on our background or what we grew up under or how we didn't get our needs met and the hurt that we experience then causes us to hurt other people. And uh, Catherine, can you just talk a little bit about how you chose your subjects, which sometimes I hate using that word, but in documentary terms, they, we call them <laughs> the subjects. Because uh, you have a few of them that we're gonna meet today. So go ahead and talk about that as director, how you connected with them and you can introduce them. Oh, wonderful, yeah. So um, it's interesting because um, really Jamie is kind of, I mean, he's connective tissue again to everybody. But I already knew that I already had the title, The Prison Within, and that I wanted to really make a film that looked at personal responsibility and personal transformation and also collective. And I knew that it had to include victims and survived victims slash survivors as well, because I really wanted to show their stories parallel to each other. And, um, kind of that, well, not kind of, that we are survivors or victims first before someone ends up in prison. And by telling those stories in parallel, I thought that that could become more apparent. And so it was really in finding Jamie's story, which I read online. And for your viewers, Jamie is um, a woman who was kidnapped and repeatedly raped and sexually assaulted, I believe when she was about nine years old. And I found her story online and she spoke really beautifully and eloquently in this story about being 30, 40 years down the road and still really not healed from the trauma that she experienced. And she spoke and she named it that because she had not healed, that she was starting to feel how she was not that much different from the men who had kidnapped it or assaulted her. She was seeing that trauma and that violence within her. And I really, that's, that, that's, the, that's the center point that I was really looking for in this film because that is where the juice is. That's where the hard stuff is. And that is something that we all have deep inside of ourselves that we're so unwilling to look at uh, and yet even talk about 
you know, in, in a public arena, which is exactly what the men are doing in the film. And at the time, Jamie was already a facilitator for Vogue in IPP. And so that's what brought me into IPP and where I got to meet Sam and Troy and Michael, who are also here with us today. Well, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. And to our viewers, if you're just tuning in because you're watching us live on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, we're talking with the team, the director and the producer behind The Prison Within, which is a documentary that was just released on Tuesday, October 25th. And we're talking with three of the men who are featured in the film and share their stories of healing. And you're gonna hear us talk about the, the words restorative justice, which might be a new term for you, but I, we're gonna continue to delve into that a little bit. But uh, gentlemen, why don't we start and have you just uh, introduce yourself and share a little bit about your, your story uh, one at a time. You can you know, take a minute or two. I'll start with you, Mike. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about, because some people still haven't seen the film yet. Uh, and we'll be enticed by what they're gonna see by hearing from you. So go ahead, Mike, could you go ahead and share first? Sure, I was hoping I was gonna go last. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's always how it happens, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Mike Nelson, and um, I served a little over 20 years in prison for a crime that I committed on January 25th, 1998. And at the time of my crime, I was 15 years old. Um, I was charged with first degree murder and sentenced to 25 years uh, to life in prison. Um, and during that time, I did a number of things. And one of those in particular was I, I participated and completed uh, the program Victim Offender Education Group, which is highlighted in this film. Um, and I, I'll just say that it really changed the way that I view not only myself, but the way that I look into this world um, and my responsibility and how I show up in this world. Um, I've been out of prison now for a little over two years and I've continued working with um, prison programs. I'm a volunteer at a prison in Central Coast, California. Um, so I've, I've dedicated myself to my community on the inside um, and doing my best to advocate on their behalf and be a representation um, of the good work um, that's happening on in on the inside and the need uh, for more programs like Vogue um, and more opportunities for healing on the inside. Thank you so much, Sam. Sam, do you hear us? <laughs> yes, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, we got Hello. you. We okay. got you. Do, um, you're here? Is, all right. My name is Sam. How are you? Yeah, I'm here. Good? Yep. Uh, my name is Sam Johnson. Um, 20, I spent 26 years in prison. I've been home three and a half years. Uh, it was a painful journey with 26 years until I met Vogue that got me the insight. It was triggered through my daughter, who was um, pulled me out the visiting room to tell me to come home. And that little girl was six years old at the time, and I needed to find out why I was causing her pain, not alone myself, everybody else. And I got introduced to Vogue through uh, a number of people. I participated in Vogue, became an inside facilitator, and it, it helped me to delve deep into my wound. I met ch uh, childhood uh, needs. Still some today is still, uh, I was still through some things, but with the help and the uh, connection with the people I'm around, the support network, I still continue to thrive. Um, I work uh, with uh, our Solus. It's a re-entry program where I, help find lifers coming home. I try to put them in a home, in a room, so they can have a better chance at re-entry back into society where it's not a strain. Our organization pay rent for them for almost up to three years and giving them a chance to go to college, school, you know, and work and get a career. So I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the film. I'm grateful for Catherine and giving me the opportunity to tell my story before people, because a lot of people go through it. I myself went through a lot of racial injustice growing up in Charleston, South Carolina. 
I know it was very racist. And I just thank God I'm alive today and to be here and to share my story with you. Thank you. Live. Thank you so much, Sam. We're gonna invite Troy to share his story. He also served as the cinematographer of the project. Troy, give us your, your background, your backstory. You just gotta unmute yourself, Troy, sorry. Or I'll just see if I can do it. Nope, I can't. Bottom of your your uh, oh, left side of the screen. I get it. I get it. Technology. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at the time when Catherine and them came in, um, I was pretty much known as the resident filmmaker inside of San Quentin. So I kind of saw it as my duty to interface with every filmmaker coming inside of the prison. Um, because at the time, many um, filmmakers and news agencies, they were coming in and they were just telling the fear mongering stories. Um, but I met Catherine. Um, I like what she had to say. There was a level of trust uh, with her. And I just began helping out, um, you know, getting sound or, you know, with camera work or whatever I could just helping out with the film. And in 2014, I paroled. And then that's actually when I became a subject in the film is um, after I paroled and was out here. Beautiful. Stand by as I move our screen around here. Lovely, I get to, I get to produce and host at the same time. I love it. Uh, if you're watching, please feel free to add comments and or questions for our crew and the subject of the film. Robertino, who actually is responsible for connecting us to you. He's our assistant director and he does a lot of our PR stuff. He says, thank you, Catherine, Aaron, everyone involved in this powerful and educational project. Let's talk a little bit about Vogue. You've referenced that a, uh, a couple times and Vogue is an acronym Right for uh, let's share that for what that what that happened and how it started inside the prison. Aaron, do you want to start with that question? Vogue. Sure. Um, I think um, it's important that folks understand that the men inside were already looking for a pathway to heal and a way to process. And while the program was ultimately formalized um, through the outside nonprofit Insight Prison Project. This was really a program that was started by the men inside. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I just, I think that's an important point and I think Aaron, and this is what absolutely makes me feel good about working with Aaron and Catherine because they give credit where credit is due. A lot of times organizations like to come in and present as though like they're coming in with the savior mentality. And what we all know is that, you know, our common bond is like we're, our ability to heal is wrapped in each other. Um, you know, even sometimes like, the, like we learn to even switch up with, with the language that we use, right? We don't necessarily, um, um, we really take a real strong look at how we're communicating about individuals. So even like early on, and I don't I don't mean to say this like in a, a bad way, I hope this is taken good, but we don't necessarily like to call people um, by their actions. We like to, you know, I committed a crime. I committed something that was wrong, but I am not my crime. Um, I am not the thing that I did. Um, and it's, I think, I just wanted to say that because I think that that's important that as we go on, that when we, even though we refer to the program as victim offenders, the dialogue that happens inside of that room moves us far beyond the labeling that divides us. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Can you talk a little bit more about that? We have encountered a lot of that in our show as we watch films, especially documentaries, but we talk about how language and how we talk about people and how we identify whether it's you know their sexual identity or whether it's their gender uh, or whether it's the crimes that they have committed whatever these are really important things that kind of seep inside our head and alter how we view each other and i really liked how you talked about the healing is wrapped up in each other but is there anything else we could be aware of 
like just talk about how we need to change our language and how we talk about is it you know whether it's victims or perpetrators what things do we say or could we be saying differently who wants to take the lead on that well I, i'll say this and then i would love somebody to jump in but i think that it's important to um for us to like how we like we have to take the long the longer road to really talk about it's easier to label somebody to thinkify somebody and this is something that we learned in the program this is this is the language that like the programs that we've been involved in has given us like right? in order for me to do something wrong to you i have to make you less than i have to call you something other than a human being in order for me to um, treat you a certain way. You have to become a punk. You got to become a buster. You got to become a faggot. You got to become some other a nigga. You got to become some other derogatory term that makes you less than human in order for me to commit a harm against you, right? And so what we try to do is remove that type of thought frame and acknowledge the humanity in everybody that we come across. I think that's huge. Just to go back to what Troy said, that as someone in the community who hasn't been to prison and on the outside, sometimes it's easy to just label someone something, like he said, in order to strip them of their humanity. And now I don't have to acknowledge you or deal with you or sympathize with you or even acknowledge that you're hurting just like I'm hurting, you know, as someone on the outside. So I think that's really important as someone in the community to remember we're not our behavior, we're not our actions, we're not our crimes, and we're not we're not our trauma. Like we're human beings and we're we're complex and what we all want though is is healing. What we all want is a sense of wholeness and a sense of community. And that's really been stripped away from us with the way that our justice system is set up now because it's not set up now to serve anyone, not to serve the community, not to serve victims, not to serve uh, people, you know, serving time for their crimes. So I think it's really important that we do take a step back and, and see our, our collective humanity. And I like what Catherine said about trauma, being able to connect us all. So even if you've never, you know, committed a crime, we've all experienced trauma. We're experiencing trauma now with the pandemic with the civil rights movement. And so that's something that connects us all. And if we could go back to that, that we're all capable of being heard and reacting in ways, you know, that really aren't who we are. I think that could help keep our humanity in, in the forefront of our minds. Thank you. There was a question in the beginning of the film. I'm going to butcher it probably, but it was something like restorative justice asks different questions like when we talk about injustices it was like we could either ask this question or we could ask that question who can who can rephrase that it helped i felt like around language go ahead Catherine. um so it was that the criminal justice system asks who did it and how can we punish them and restorative justice asks what happened and how can we heal it yeah that is powerful. That's really powerful, yeah. Right, so it's reframing. Can you say it just one more time? And I'm gonna type it in the, the comments. I think this is, this is uh, as you're watching this and is hopefully you go and support this independent film here and these filmmakers, please go and share their work because this is gonna, this is reframing how we look at society and justice and racism, Black Lives Matter. These questions are important. So can you say that again? Sure, it's a uh, criminal justice asks who did it and how can we punish them? And restorative justice asks what happened and how can we heal it? Great, great. If you're watching and you have any questions that you want to ask our panel here, we have Judy who wants some comments and talk around youth offenders uh, in the system. Any comments or questions around that? <sighs> Go ahead, Mike. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, I think there are a, there is a special need to address um, youth offenders in the criminal justice system. I I'm somebody who committed a crime at the age of 15, um, and I want I want to first by saying that uh, one of the things that I learned through the Vogue program um, in my work with Jamie and a lot of other people is that I first take responsibility. Um, I'm personally not somebody who blames the system for my choices at 15. I also acknowledge at 15 I was hurting 
Um, and so making those connections of how I was hurting and then wound up at 15 year old at 15 year old participating in the taking of another human life. Um, and so I just want to start off by saying that, that, that I am somebody who first looks at how did I contribute to the system that exists? Um, and in that I was 15. And so there are, there are a number of conversations that I think we must have around youth offenders uh, in particular about incarcerating them as children uh, and then throwing them into an environment that does not support, um, overall does not support their growth and their healing. Um, fortunately, you know, I was somebody who uh, ended up in a prison like San Quentin State Prison that is not like most prisons where it has many opportunities that are available uh, to the people there. Um, and again, story of Mo. Um, and so through my journey, I was afforded many opportunities to look at myself um, and to understand the connections between hurting and harming um, and unraveling that. Um, work that I do with you offenders, uh, we spend special, we, we take a lot of special care on addressing uh, their childhood traumas um, and helping them explore the connections between their traumas and the harms that they commit and helping them see that they, like Troy was saying, that they're much more, they're beyond um, th their acts. Um, th th they were more complex that we, you know, we make up so many, um, we are so many roles in our lives in the way that we show up. Um, fortunately, there are a lot of folks on the inside now who are uh, being proactive and who are taking the time um, to care for themselves um, and to create opportunities for themselves while on the inside and not just sitting around, um, as a lot of folks may think, um, just sitting around and doing nothing. Um, you know, there are many people on the inside, including youth offenders who are doing really good heart work, the deep, meaningful work that it takes, the courage that it takes to unravel their traumas and to take responsibilities for that way as they live their lives inside and as they prepare to get out, they are more whole beings um, and they have a deeper sense of who they are in this world and what value they hold. Um, I am not somebody who, when we talk about language, you can call me anything you want. Um, I know the truth. Uh, I know the truth of who I am. Uh, that includes committing a crime, uh, and my life includes so much more. Um, and so, you know, as you watch this film, you'll meet Jamie. If you've already seen it, you've met her, which I'm deeply grateful for that the world gets to know her. Um, but she taught me how to take full responsibility of myself and to own my power. Um, and through this film, I think, I believe that anybody who watches will connect peace within themselves, um, of that truth of who we all are, um, and the power that we hold in this world. Um, and, and, and that's, and I hope, I hope people start to think about when we talk about youth offenders, you know, how can we take special care of our young people? You know, not just when they're incarcerated, uh, but before we even get to that place, um, you know, the needs that they have now. Um, so, yeah. So thank you for that question, Judy. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments or questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. Again, if you're just joining us, we're with the, the team, the director and the producer, cinematographer and featured stories of the prison within which just came out on video and demand you can watch it on amazon or wherever you find yourself these days as we're all sheltering in place and dealing with pandemic 2020 here uh catherine what are some of the hopes as you move forward and calls to action i mean there are things that we could be doing the film ends with ways that people can get involved and obviously you and aaron both have an invested interest in the continued restorative justice journey. So can you share a little bit about next steps when people watch the film and how they can get involved? Well, I, I think it's twofold. Um, one, I, I think that the concept of the prison within is very important. It's about the personal and the collective. Um, so, you know, the personal being what am I responsible for in this world with myself and how can I heal that? And then really the collective, which I think is kind of like the ship kind of carrying the whole film along is this, you know, the systemic injustices that are so alive 
in our society today that have created our systems of mass incarceration. And both need to be healed, the, the personal and the collective. So my hope is, is like like Michael said, that when people do watch this film, that they see themselves reflected in it in some way. One, on a personal level. And then two, really, once you start working on the personal, I think you kind of have to start working on the collective as well. So my hope is for people to see that connection. Another thing I think really people need to see and a, a point of the film is that if we are going to heal, that it's it's not top down. It's it's Troy and it's Michael and it's Sam who are coming out of prison, who are leaders in their communities, who are really the ones to stop these cycles, to you know, to stop the cycles of incarceration. Um, it's not the state, it's them. They're really the leaders and they're really the ones that have the voices and the know-how to stop it. And so I hope that people get these messages and that they become involved really in how, however they see fit. You know, it, it could just be more personal introspection. It could be becoming a volunteer with the IPP. You know, it just, just something to, to engage in some way. It's wonderful. Christina, do you want to ask a follow-up question, comment? I actually just wanted to add to what she was saying about how it doesn't start from the top down. It starts with with Michael. It starts with Troy. It starts with me. Um, so it starts with individuals realizing that you can heal. You deserve to heal. Like That is something that you should be reaching for. It's not something to, I don't know, to be afraid of. It is very difficult. It is very painful. Uh, but something beautiful that came away for me watching The Prison Within was that it helped me realize, you know what, you know, we've had family members that have gone through the system and some of them are with us and some of them are no longer with us. But it's important that we still feel like we should talk about this. We should gather our family together and strengthen ourselves and really address these issues. And that's what we've done. We reached out to an organization. I'm in the Bay Area and this is an organization in Oakland. And it's called Sankova Holistic uh, Counseling for Families. So that's what my family is moving forward doing. And I really encourage everyone who's in a position to do that, to really start talking about the things that are, are hurting us, the things that we keep deep down inside that we don't talk about that can ultimately result in something tragic happening down the line. So I just want to encourage everyone, you know, to, to heal, to heal others, to, to spread love and to start having these conversations. I think that the film is a fantastic way to start having these conversations because that's that's what it's about. We got to watch Mike and Troy and Sam, we got to watch them tackle these just immeasurable, painful conversations. Like some of the most difficult things that we have to deal with as human beings. And that is, you know, how do we love each other after experience extreme trauma? More than that, how do we love ourselves? And I feel like that's the place when you can get to that, where you mm -hmm. believe that you deserve love unconditionally, you deserve forgiveness, you deserve a fresh start, you deserve restoration. I think if we can get there as a community, like Catherine said, start with yourself, spread that out to your family, that's going to spread to the communities. And I think that's how we're really going to start to evolve as communities and, and keep our eyes on what is going on with our prison system. It's not working. And so we have to do something about it. I, don't, I, I love that this is bringing this to our attention. We're having these conversations. It's not working. It's not working for anyone. It's definitely something that we have to change. I'm going to bring uh, Troy and Sam to have a couple uh, comments as well before I do that. What I also appreciated about the film was this uh, emphasis on people making peace, those who have been harmed and hurt and feel as if they need to see some movement forward in their healing process, how do they move through. Jamie, who was referenced earlier, this phenomenal job of writing letters. There's so many ways that you can process your harm and your, your trauma in your life. I've never experienced uh, a loved one having to go to jail, but I've experienced trauma through suicide and the loss of loved ones in really traumatic ways and being able to write letters and, and process this through in a therapeutic way has been completely healing for me. And the power of the arts 
have helped me process too. So I love that Troy got to be a part of telling this story. So Troy, you said you wanted to add something. Go ahead and share your comments. Oh. Always think about like how we were being labeled. And how, oh, you're good. And, and you're my, good. My, you're okay, good. I did. I just <laughs> all right. How we were being labeled and how we would like want to be labeled and how like how does society come up with these terms? So even when we started off today, we were talking about um, calling us like subjects in the film. And even myself um, as a filmmaker, also who have to refer to people as subjects. I'm like that. That, that term just really doesn't lend to the fullness of what. It actually is, but it's just a commonly like used term, right? But I just wanted to emphasize that the 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 people in this film, they're not just subjects in the film, but they're actually our educators. Like they're they're actually like educating us about some things that could really help change our society if you really just take a moment and really look at what it is that their experience is um teaching us. So I just wanted to add that um, that level. Right on. Thank you so much, Sam. You had something to say. Um, yeah, you know, I, I look at the protest that's going on. I look at the youth, and then I connect with childhood drama, and I look at the unmet needs as an adult, not dealing with the childhood trauma. That that little voice that's inside that's still hurt. I look at the action of the people on the protest, the young people, how they're destroying things. I see nothing but pain. I hear pain. I feel their pain. But society is still at bay. Uh, people fighting to be accepted. Through my life growing up, a black man in Austin, South Carolina, I was rejected so many times. And then when I came home to be healed, my father would abuse me. I spent 18 years in San Quentin behind those walls where I was called a, a nothing, a nobody, the scum of the earth. When all that time I had family, I had family members outside waiting on me, praying for me, loving me, crying for me. Lost a lot of one who died. My victim hit their family, the pain, the hurt, and society stay at bay instead of coming together. To sit at the table. I mean, we have 35 in the state of California. Hundreds of thousands of people locked up and incarcerated because of unmet need are not feeling equal and decided to, to, to lash out at what they had because they wasn't educated. We receive a lot of educated because we sit down and we stripped ourselves completely naked and we voiced everything. We, we point out the hurt pain brings the pain of cost. And that's what's happening with the youth today. I just want to know when America is going to just sit to the table and let's stop all of this racist stuff. I know it's going to take a lot. It's going to be years. It might don't ever happen in this time. But it, people are dying. I look at the man right now in COVID who is supposed to have the opportunity of coming home right now. But they dying behind the walls of San Quentin and all other prisons, and it hurts so bad because we're holding people instead of letting them go home to be with family or separating them, we're putting them still in the cell with somebody who has COVID instead of looking directly at what's causing it. And we know it's overcrowding still, but we're still being punished. It's a punishment. And then I won't call it murder because people are dying. But we, we we need to listen to the voices. We need to sit at the table. And we have bad officers. We need to arrest those officers as quick as possible. So we won't destroy things because people uh, feel they're not being heard. I have a loved one who got killed, got shot, whatever the case is. But people still sitting on the inside. They still go on with their life while loved ones have died. Uh, the guy who got shot in, in um, Waco or whatever, excuse me, the place, Milwaukee, who got shot in the back. Now this young man is paralyzed. Why? Because he walked away. Yet still he got shot. Why? Because of the cover of his skin. I mean, why? What? What? I, was, I didn't ask for this beautiful color. I used to hate this color because I wasn't accepted by whites. I hate, I asked God, why'd you give me a black 
white skin. Why people hate me and I just want to be loved. Six years old, little kid, just want to be loved. I just want to learn. And it just found it so hard to learn. I couldn't concentrate in school. I struggled through school. From school to prison pipeline, I winded up in prison. 26 years of my life. But God touched me through Catherine and through, through Vogue and through Yoshi and through Troy and through the people I met. Because we were struggling in the same thing. We were feeling so much pain, so much hurt. And we got together. How are we going to heal each other? How am I going to keep my little girl from crying? My daughters, my four ki I have five kids, four girl and a boy, seven grandkids. Mm -hmm. And I worry about my wow. grandkids growing up in this society. You know, it just it just hurt. It, it, it mm -hmm. just sitting here it hurts like crazy. And I just want to know when we come. Thank God for the filmmakers that bring our stories out and expose things. And maybe we can re-educate people. It's going to take a while. It's take a struggle, a struggle. But we have to be open when they come and approach. We can't just be angry and, uh, you know, and, and shut things down. Because when people want forgiveness, we have to ask for, you know, give them forgiveness and, and try to forgive in our heart. But it's a painful thing. Just remember, adults carry pain, fathers and mothers. Fathers, I ask you to sit with your family and talk with your kids. Let them know what's going on in you, why you do yeah. what you do. But be there when they need to talk. My dad didn't listen to me. Go out and play. Mm. My father had a sixth grade education, but he tried to love me. But alcohol got a hold of him. And our mm. family was dysfunctional. The beatings, the abuse. But God let me live through it. I'm married and I have family and I have friends and I have people who are listening. Please talk to friends. You can yeah. places I can't get in places, but let yeah. them know. Look at watch right. the film. Call family yeah. to watch the film. Honest yeah. to God. Watch the film. And then you tell yourself and look in the mirror. Go to the mirror and find out what's going on with yourself to be healed. We're willing to heal. We'll work, we'll come around. COVID Amen. is stopping a lot of things. And I, I know I'm I'm going and, through, and, but it's just painful. But thank you. And, God and bless this, and all this, of you guys. And I just want to add this this message. As we hear Sam talk, I hope the viewers don't take this message as this is just a black man talking to black people. Like this is me, no. this is this message is for humanity, right? Like, right. like again, right. this is, don't matter the color of your skin, you had a father that beat you, you had the stuff that you went through. We have stuff that we're going through in this society, and we just got to take a look at it completely and quit Amen. labeling and dismissing each other. Amen. I want to, yeah. Just we say, Amen, Sam. You got to, you got to platform. Say, you got, you got, you got to keep speaking and sharing your story. And thank you so much for your time. And uh, Brave Maker exists to see okay. justice and diversity and inclusion in the world. And we believe that the arts are a big part of it. And we applaud you. Uh, I know we're going over time, but I need, I need to, we need to do one more question for the filmmakers because Brave Maker is all about getting stories out into the world. And we uh, are headquartered in the, in the Bay Area and we are trying to help Bay Area filmmakers. And I love that this was centered in the Bay Area, which is so beautiful. I wanna take just one minute to talk about our fiscal sponsorships. If you are a filmmaker and you wanna make a film, we have fiscal sponsorships to help you get your film moving forward. And that's gonna give Catherine and Aaron and Troy a minute to think about uh, how you would answer this question. How do people tell their stories? How do they break in? How do they get behind the camera or in front of a camera or write it or direct it or document it? And I'm gonna show you a one minute trailer to a new film that's coming out by a woman who's doing her very first film as an adult to express the need for addiction recovery around gambling. So watch the one minute trailer of our fiscally sponsored project called The, the Skelet Thread. I didn't. I wouldn't. We have you on surveillance tape at the school. I think I need to speak to a lawyer. Yo, yo, it's true. About the cops? Yeah. How do you know? Yeah, my, my dad told me last night. I know. You're good at it. You're a great teacher. You care more than most people. I thought you cared. Our 
You're gonna get what you deserve. You're a joke. I know we couldn't trust you. Confess, you did it. God, please. You can you can go check out the film at brave bravemaker.com slash the scarlet thread. So I'd love to hear from you as our ah la la la. I'm no y'all can hear me, right? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Maybe Christina, I'm just muted for you. Sorry. Uh, so the Scarlet Thread is a film that's coming out soon. So I'd love to hear from you, filmmakers. How do you want to encourage uh, through our podcast, through our live show here? How do people make their stuff? How do people get their story told? What would you say from the filmmaker's perspective? I'll end there. <laughs> uh, well, the, the way that I started making this film, it was me and my now husband, Massimo Bardetti, who's also a producer and cinematographer on the film. And we just kind of dove in. It was very DIY, um, which is a very tough way to make a film, I, I have to say. I, I don't know if I want my next film to be made that way. <laughs> However, <laughs> that being said, here we are, and we're on Amazon and iTunes, and we got a distributor. So, um, you know, if you're passionate, it's, it's gonna happen. Definitely pick a subject that you are 100% passionate about, that you will not lose your passion for, because it, you know, this documentary took at least six years to make. And one, because independent documentaries do take a long time to make. And two, because you're kind of always looking for money. And so it's kind of stop, stop, you know, start, stop, start, stop. So yeah, my advice, I guess at this point is have the passion and do it. Just do it, make it happen. Any other comments from you, Aaron or Troy, anybody else? I, I'm just going to throw out one uh, additional uh, comment to what Catherine was saying. It, it's having the passion, but also remembering that the voices you're sharing aren't your own. That the stories you chose and that you're passionate about, there's a, there's a real reality check you need to give yourself about your own ego and, and your own voice and realize that you were inspired by a story and you want to amplify and share that story, but it's their story. And that's what Catherine and I have focused so hard on is really making sure that Troy and Sam and Michael and Eddie and all the guys inside and, and, and Dion and, um, and Jamie, that their voices are heard, um, that we are providing that platform for them because that's what independent filmmaking should be about. Absolutely. Right on. Yeah, pick up a pick up a camera and just go do something with it. <laughs> Grab your iPhone. Never, never, never give up. My dream started inside. I, I spent my first ten years in prison dreaming about um, being a filmmaker. Right, mm -hmm. all I had was my imagination and a pencil and a whole bunch of books, and that was it. And then, you know, look at me now, ma. <laughs> 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 That's fantastic. Well, we're very, very proud. Yeah, say to hi to mom, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we're very proud to have hosted this conversation. So thank you, Catherine and Aaron and Troy and Sam and Mike. We really love this film. And Christina and I are going to continue to promote you this week. I hope you get a lot of views on every video platform. Please, 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 mm -hmm. if you're watching this right now, share it. Share it on your, on your platforms. Share their website, theprisonwithin.org. And know that we, as a brave maker, as a nonprofit brave maker, we exist on your generosity to continue to bring attention to such great stories. We would love to help you in any way. If you have questions, uh, if you want to talk about getting your film, you just heard it. No excuse. You can make it happen. You can have a pencil and a piece of paper and an iPhone, and that's all you need to get a story made. So email me, Tony at bravemaker.com. And uh, we would love to help you get your story. Christina, final words from you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Sam touched on him a little bit, but if we could all send our prayers and well wishes out to Jacob Blake, his mother, Julia Jackson, is yes. a huge believer in the power of prayer. So I just want to put that out there. Everyone continue to pray for him. Uh, him and his family have a lot of healing and a long journey ahead of them. And so I just want to say that we're praying for them and uh, continue fighting for human rights, for justice for all. Uh, I know we're, we have a lot of challenges facing us in California. We have so much going on, pandemic and fires and racism and a lot of things.
but keep love in the forefront of your mind. Never give up. Continue to believe. And uh, yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, back to you, Tony. And brave stories change the world. <laughs> and you're the story. You are the story. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you. Thank you. Bye, Tony. Bye.